This is ECCTV.org, Every Creature Commission Television. Welcome to our Second World Revival Conference Special with the Reverend Dr. Suresh Ramakandran of Mount Carmel Theological College in Sri Lanka. Well, this is great, great praise music of a Tamil variety, and I'm absolutely delighted in the name of the Lord Jesus to live stream this revival conference today, coming to you from Rosan Sea, North Wales. Suresh, come and join us. This is Suresh Ramakandra, my dear, dear pal from years and years ago. And this, this music's amazing, Suresh. We give Jesus all the praise and all the glory as Suresh is coming to minister God's word to you right now. Well, uh, greetings to all of you in the name of Jesus. And uh, yesterday when my pal Dave and I were talking about uh, revival in its true sense of the word, we were discussing as to how wrongly the church has perceived revival. And revival for many is what they receive from God. Now I, I believe that God is a giver. He, he is a blesser. He cannot not bless. He cannot not give. Why? Because everything belongs to him. The silver and the gold and everything. And uh, he gives. He blesses. But... We should not always be on the receiving end. We shouldn't always ask and ask and ask and ask. And, and that's not revival. Revival is when we come to a point where we give uh, to God. We give our lives and we give everything unto God. Now, God uh, doesn't need uh, believers. He needs disciples. Now, in the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 onwards, say, that Jesus, giving a great commission to the church, says, Go ye into all nations and make disciples, not believers. Now, I used to be a Hindu, worshipping 330 million gods. So, wh what is wrong with one extra? So, we, we, we could believe in Jesus. There are so many people who are not Christians in the world today, who believe Jesus to be perhaps God or a demigod, or a semi-demigod, or whatever. But that is not what our God is after. Our God is after disciples. Now, what is the difference, you may ask, between a believer and a disciple? Oh, there are so many dif differences. But I would like to read only one verse from Matthew chapter 5 and show you the difference between a believer and a disciple. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. So now here we see that this transpires by the banks of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus saw multitudes were coming to him from all over, from Decapolis, from Galilee, from Nazareth, from Jerusalem, and uh, all over Judea. So Jesus thought, okay, now this is a huge multitude. Uh, I cannot talk to them from the banks, so let me ascend a little hill there. If you go to Israel, you will still see uh, a place called the Mount of Beatitudes. So Jesus ascended to that place, and when he sat down, his disciples were already there. The disciples came to them, came to him. And then he opened his mouth and began to speak to them. The difference between a believer and a disciple is found here. A believer will have thousand and one reasons why they can't get up on that hill. When Jesus saw the multitudes, the believers would say, well, Jesus never discussed it with us. Jesus never stopped and asked us, 
um, can I go up to that hill? Would you come with me? Right? Or b- believers would say, well, Jesus never told us to come up to that mountain. Right? So believers would wait for Jesus to call them to follow him. To invite them to follow him. To discuss matters with them. Uh, would you like it if I get up there? Would it be possible for you to come? You know, that's the sort of uh, the, the mentality the believers have. And that's what's happened to the church today. If Jesus can't do anything without discussing and getting the opinion from the believer. The disciple doesn't worry about any of those. The disciple is always focused in Jesus. And the disciple would follow Jesus wherever he goes without questioning. And Jesus went up. He didn't stop and turn and he, he didn't say, Peter, come with me. Hey, John, come with me. Uh, would you like to come with me? Is it okay? Uh, could you come with me? No. He just went and the disciples followed. The believers would crawl. The believers would say, Jesus, you said you will be with me wherever I go. So you better come with me. But the disciple would say, Jesus, I don't care where you go. I will follow. So the disciples went up there. Now, now imagine this scenario. If you see somebody walking and if Jesus is going behind them, then they are believers. If you see Jesus walking, and if anybody following Jesus, they are disciples. Believers would go before Jesus, asking Jesus to come. Lord, come with me. I can't go to church. I I, I need a holiday. I, I, I need to go there. I need to visit them. I need to enjoy my life. But because you are omnipresent, you come with me wherever I go. That's a believer. A disciple would look to see where Jesus goes and it doesn't matter where he goes at what time and to do what the disciple will follow and that's what Jesus wants he said go ye into the world and make disciples now my dear friends that's not the message that I'm going to bring to you today are we in need of God using us would you like to be used by God would you like to be used to by Jesus. Now I, I have been a musician, a television singer and uh, I am a psychologist and, and I have uh, been a manager in a company. I have done so many jobs. But for the past 29 years, I am a full-time pastor and I'll tell you, serving the Lord, being in the ministry, I'll beat all the challenges and the, and the battles that we have to wage is the best thing one could do. I have been, I was one of the top stars in Sri Lanka in television. I was a singer, I was a musician, and, uh, and uh, I had the people's attraction. People were so much after me. I had a lot of money. I had a lot of fame. But I'll tell you, when I became a minister, I entered a battleground. And to date, I'm battling one battle after another. It's a huge warfare. But I, I, I'll tell you, serving the Lord is the best one could do because at the end of the day when I get to heaven I want to hear this from Jesus well done my good and faithful servant it doesn't matter what I lose on this world it doesn't matter what happens to me on this world from 2007 to 2010 even the Sri Lankan government was after me the underworld was paid 3 million to kill me and 200 underworld uh, Cads were mobilized to shoot me on sight. For three and a half years, I, I was wearing a disguise and I was running from one country to another because these people were trying to kill me. But I'll tell you, this life is the most interesting life because this is the life of serving God in the way one should serve. I am so proud and I am so happy to be called a disciple of Jesus because I don't ask Jesus to follow me. I don't ask Jesus to come where I want to go. But I want to go where Jesus goes. I want to do what Jesus wants me to do because that 
is revival. And if you give your heart, your soul, your entire being to the Lord, hey, you are already in the revival. The revival begins in you. You don't have to wait till revival happens somewhere and go and catch that revival and bring it. Revival is not like that. Revival happens within us. And I believe I'm enjoying this revival for the past 29 years. And I'm revived as you see. I'm not a lazy speaker. I'm speaking in my third language. So I have to think in my first and then I have to translate and I have to put it out in my third language. And still you see my exuberance. You still see my excitement. You still see a burning fire in me. Why? Because I am in the revival. The revival is within us. When? When we give ourselves to God. Not when we want God to bless us. Of course God will bless you. God will give you, but you give yourself and everything of yours to God and then you are already in revival. Let me get into the message today. Let's turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 and verse 1. After these things, and I'm going to in a minute bring you to see what things. Okay, After these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. The word that I want to highlight here is the other. Other. After these things the Lord appointed other seventy also. Other. Now, Jesus is appointing another group of people. 35 sets of people. 2 by 2 makes 70. Now, why would he not use other people other than the 70? Now, the word other refers to the 70. But I am going to concentrate on those who are not one of the 70. Are you with me? Other. Now I am not going to talk about these 70. Okay. Although these 70 are called the other 70. To appoint this 70. He does not use some others. Right. Now since he didn't use some others. He had to use another 70. So in order to use the other 70, he did not use some others of who I am going to talk about. Why? Because today's message is God use me. God use me. Jesus use me. Why? I need to be useful. There are so many Christians in the world. They are Christians but they are useless. They are useless to God. They are useless to Jesus. They are useless to Christendom. They are useless to the church. Hey, they are useless to the world. When you are useless to God, then you are useful to the devil. When you are useless to the church, then you are useful to Satan's synagogue. I want to be useful to God. I want to be useful. And I don't want to be like those who are not in this group of 70. Why? Because Jesus did not use them. Why? Let me come to that. That's the message today, my dear friends. Now, when Jesus says, in verse 2, when you guys go, two by two, do something. Now today, as a pastor and a principal of a theological college, there are times when we do evangelistic meetings. I have students with who we go once in three months to new areas where the gospel has not been preached in Sri Lanka. Last December, we went to the former war-torn area of Sri Lanka. They still don't have uh, electricity. We went to Vavunia and from Vavunia we went deep into the, the, the jungle areas where people live with no electricity, no water, just huts. 
and we stayed there. We went from one corner to the next preaching the gospel. We preached the gospel. And I'll tell you, every time I send groups to go and distribute tracts, go and preach the gospel, you know what I say? I tell them, go with the anointing. Pray. Pray in tongues. Pray in uh, tongues so that the Lord would give you the empowerment. In our college, there is a program where for one hour, everybody needs to pray in tongues because I believe that praying in tongues is the secret language we have with God and we will be strengthened and will be used, will be empowered when we are a tongue-speaking Christian. And I tell them, go, pray, bind the strong man, destroy the devil, pull down the strongholds and pray. Now Jesus is sending 70 people, two by two, 35 groups. He should have told them, you go likewise, pray, you pray and go. You bind the strong man and go. But look at what he says. He says in verse 2, Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. He doesn't say you pray for anointing. He doesn't say you bind the strong man on your way. He doesn't say anything else. He says, pray that God would have more laborers in the vineyard. That is the prayer of Jesus for the past 2,000 years. We need more laborers. We had wonderful laborers in the past in many countries. I'm, I'm speaking, I'm preaching here from Wales. In Wales, we had great men of God like Rees Howells. We had Smith Wigglesworth. We had so many great people in Wales. We had so many great preachers in England. It, it was from England that we Sri Lankans received the gospel. These missionaries came to India. These missionaries came to Sri Lanka starting from uh, starting with William Carey. And it is because of the United Kingdom that a person like me became a Christian. But look at these nations now. These nations have gone to the devil. These nations have gone to the dog. Why? Because they lost the laborers. Now there are no, not enough laborers to work in the vineyard of Christ. And so many people who call themselves pastors, reverends, vicars, and men of God are no longer serving Jesus, but they are serving mammon. They are serving the world. They have deteriorated from being what God wanted them to be. They have lost the vision. They have lost the passion. They have lost the spirit. It's another Jesus, a social Jesus, a social gospel that they are after. The emerging church is a man-pleasing church. They are no longer trying to please God. They are, they are no longer Bible abiding. They want to put things into the Bible and corrupt what was given to us in the form of the word of God through the apostles. So the prayer of Jesus has remained the same for the past 2000 years. I need laborers. And I am only too proud to say that I am one of those who God has chosen and he's using. I don't want to corrupt the Bible. I don't want to put in my ideologies. I want to abide by the word. And I want to serve Jesus the way he wants me to serve him. Not the way the nation, not the way the legislation, not the way the political correctness wants me to serve God but the way Jesus wants me to serve him. And I'm really glad the reason why for over 20 years now, 22 years, I'm remaining a friend with my dear friend Dave. And I'm working with him. Why? Because I see another me in him. The same passion, the same love, the same crave to serve the Lord. I'll be to the losses. We don't care what we lose because we have gained something. We already have gained Jesus in the form the Bible portrays Jesus. And we know that we have the eternal life that God has given us. And one day Jesus is going to tell us when we meet him face to face, well done, my good and faithful 
servant. And we don't want the world to tell us, well done Suresh, well done Dave. We don't want the world to say, oh you are so attractive, we want to come behind you. No. We are so less attractive to the world because we want to serve the Lord the way the Lord wants us to serve him. And the prayer of Jesus in verse 2 is this. Hey you guys, you go, but when you go, Make this prayer. This is my prayer request, says Jesus. Hey, this is the prayer request of Jesus. He is saying, ask the Father to give laborers because the harvest is plenty. The laborers are few. I'm, I'm sending only 35 groups of you guys, he says. So I need more. So pray. Now my question is this. My dear friends, if the prayer request of Jesus is the need of more laborers. Why did he disuse some people? Why did he not use those people but used only the 70? Are you with me now? Do you see where I'm trying to uh, take you? Yes, we are talking about 70 people here but my concentration is not the 70 people. To use the 70, he did not use some others. Why did he not use them when he actually want more laborers? He wants more laborers because the harvest is plenty and the laborers are few. And still he decides to not use some people. So I'm going to talk about these three groups of people who Jesus did not use. And they are found in chapter 9. I said, I will explain after these things. After these things, these things are found in chapter 9 of Luke. And chapter 9 is a very busy chapter. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but, but uh, he, will, he calls his 12 disciples and he gives them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases and he sends them to preach the kingdom. And then later on, uh, you would see that Jesus is feeding 5,000 people. And he's healing the sick. And so many things are transpiring in chapter 9. It's a busy, busy chapter. Okay. But when we come down to verse 57 and 58, something very intriguing happens. Our concentration is going to be on verses 57, 58, 59, 60, 61 and 62. In which I'm going to talk to you about the three groups of people who Jesus did not use. Group number one, verse 57. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee with us so wherever thou goest. Wow. What a luck. What a wonderful uh, thing. Imagine if you were with Jesus and Jesus is going from town to town performing miracles, signs and wonders. And you know that in the heart of Jesus, he is craving to have more laborers. Of course, if he told what he told in chapter 10 verse 2 to those 70 people. Now you better pray on your way when you go. You pray for more laborers. He obviously would have uh, shared that to those people, the disciples and others uh, in chapter 9 also. He would have always you know, said, well, I need more people, I need more people, you know. And then all of a sudden somebody comes up and says, hey, Jesus, you know what? I am going to follow you wherever you go. And what would uh, you expect Jesus to do? I, I would expect Jesus to stop and get that man to come and say, Praise the Lord. Wonderful. You are the guy who we need. Look at him. He would have told to others. Look at this guy. Look at the commitment. He wants to follow me wherever I go. So Jesus should have become excited, happy, because somebody is committing himself to follow Jesus. But something very strange happens. Look at verse 58. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes. And birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to ha lay his head. Jesus is discouraging him just like that. Jesus is chopping his expectations just like that. 
you know jesus is not interested in that guy he is saying no i don't have a place to stay so pointless coming after me now i was wondering now this happens in galilee okay and jesus did have a house that he had rented we know that in kafarnaum jesus had a house and uh, jesus was not uh, busy 24/7 there were times when jesus slept there were times when jesus ate there were times when jesus rested i'm not saying jesus lied here what i'm saying is jesus is discouraging this man completely on his first decision itself jesus says no you can't come behind me why because i don't have a place to rest even foxes have holes now now he doesn't have to talk about foxes and birds here totally out of context because this fellow says lord i will follow thee with us wherever thou goest this fellow is apparently willing to sleep anywhere i mean look look at that i mean he is willing to go with jesus anywhere and if jesus has no place to sleep he seems to be okay about it he is not interested in anything but jesus is discouraging him saying foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests but the son of man hath not with the where to lay his head now my dear friends if that man responded to jesus by saying it is okay lord i will still follow thee then i believe the holy spirit would have inspired luke to insert that but the reason why the talk about this guy stops here is because he did not follow jesus that speaks volumes to me i'll tell you why this man had been around jesus throughout chapter 9 he saw jesus empowering the disciples jesus gives disciples the power and the authority to cast devils out and to heal the sick and it's a very attractive thing isn't it miss my dear friends it is very attractive so many people are after gifts of the spirit so many people want to perform so many people want to get up there and pray and see people fall many people want to see demons flee when they pray many people want to see crippled people get up off their wheelchairs and be healed when they pray and today i read a lot of i not i read but i i get my hands on to a lot of magazines in which man is glorified man is glorified oh look at this man he is performing signs and wonders he is casting demons out and i believe this man here saw what happened to the disciples when jesus empowered them and he wanted that wow if i am with jesus even i could be able to cast demons out even i could pray for the sick and they'll heal they'll get healed i want to be a performer i want to do and then he saw later on jesus feeding the 5000 men and this guy perhaps thought wow if i am with jesus i'll never go hungry why because jesus can always feed me this man was after the worldly attractions that one could get through jesus this is the social gospel that this guy was after jesus was feeding people healing people he directly healed them and he gave authority to his disciples to heal them so there was healing feeding taking care of nurturing love care extended to people and this guy was attracted this guy was attracted to the social gospel and he wanted to be part a part of that and jesus says sorry you cannot come behind me why because if you think this is christianity sorry to tell you there is a true side of christianity 
a true side of Christianity where even the Son of Man does not have a place to lay his head. My dear friends, true Christianity involves sacrifice. True Christianity involves giving of one's whole being to God. True Christianity involves a sacrificial life. A life not after luxury. A life not after rest. A life not after tranquility that the world is providing. That is why the devil has successfully removed so many true Christians from Christendom and thrown them back to the world. Look at the world. Compared to true Christianity, the world has become a comfortable place. Here Jesus is telling him, it is not comfortable to follow me. Because if you follow me, you will not be comfortable. You cannot sleep when you want to sleep. You cannot eat when you want to eat. You cannot rest when you want to rest. Why? Because Christianity is a battleground. Paul says, Paul says when he came to almost to the end of his life, he says, I fought a good fight. His entire Christianity was a fight. I became a Christian in 1979. And when I first became a Christian, my mother beat me to bleed and tied me onto a tree and broke ant nests, yellow ant nests, for them ants to bite me and sting me. And she was inflicting a slow death on me. But God miraculously saved me and he saved my mother also. She also became a Christian. Many of you know my testimony. But my trials and my problems did not end there. I still, that was 1979 and this is 2015, I still go through battles, problems, turmoils and hardships. Why? Christianity is not a bed of roses. It's not a soft path. It's a life of sacrifice. It's a battleground. Only people with backbones can remain in the ministry. Only people who can stand up to the faith can be in the ministry. Only smart Strong, daring people can be used by God. But the world is full of other people who are falling into comfort zones. Look at the churches today. Very comfortable. Very attractive church services. Music soothing the ears of people. But look at the lyrics. How many of the songs do you see glorifying Jesus? I'm saying now in English. I, I don't like to sing many of the modern songs today. Why? Because in many of the choruses and the songs that they sing in churches, the word Jesus is missing. In June, we spent a month in America. And in every service, I would turn around to Mercy, who is usually seated next to me, and I would tell her, Mercy, I don't see Jesus mentioned in this song. And there are so many songs that don't glorify God, but gratify the senses of humans. Soothing to hear. Lovely. And many sermons preached to, to just soothing, to be a soothing to the ears of the believers. You can do whatever you want. God understands. The grace is, is disrupted. It's taught in a different way. Oh, you know, we are not under law. We are under grace. So you can do anything and get away with it. The devil has entered the church. Evil has entered the church in disguise because people have not stood to the faith that they have received from the word of God. It's sad. I come from Sri Lanka. It's not a Christian country. It's a country where Christians are persecuted. But I come to these western countries which used to be called Christian countries. Where did we get the Bible? English Bible from? England. 1611. England. I still use that Bible when I uh, read the Bible in English. I use that. But today there are so many Bible versions to, to suit the world. To suit the people. To suit the wrong doctrines of the world. 
to suit the evils from the world to come into the church the true jesus and the true gospel and the true christianity has been now dismissed from the church because of comfort many people found the church to be a uncomfortable place the church became an uncomfortable place i'll tell you something the church is supposed to be an uncomfortable place for the devil and his stooges and to keep them in the church the church began to dilute its doctrines to dilute its values to dilute its norms to suit the people to make the church a comfortable place for people to come and today those who go to church many of those who go to church are going to comfortable churches they sit in comfortable worship and they hear comfortable messages and they are so happy i'll tell you my dear friends that is not christianity those are the people who like this person here want jesus to follow jesus the way they want they want jesus to feed them they want jesus to heal them they want jesus to to cure them of all the demons but they don't want the hard life and jesus says i'm sorry you cannot come behind me and jesus used another 70 are you with me now he did not use these people but he used another 70 and i am so glad that i don't belong to this group but the other 70 i don't belong to those who say oh i want lord jesus give me a comfortable sleep lord you give me a comfortable life you give me a comfortable ministry i like to i like to as a human being i like to run a church, a comfortable church i like to run a comfortable bible college i like to live a comfortable life because i am human but if i am crucified with christ if i am crucified with my christ and if i don't live it's jesus who lives in me then it's not what i want it's what he wants that i would like to do my dear friends my dear my very dear friends if you are after the good things that jesus gives that's fine but you need the other side also you need to give your total self unto god and say lord i don't care even i if i don't have a comfortable church even if i don't have a comfortable life even if i don't have the worldly comforts in the christianity that you are providing i will still follow you then my dear friends like the other 70 god can use you that's number 1 i believe the lord is speaking to many of you already it's not it's not the comfort that we need it's the commission that we need to follow the commission okay now let's go to verse 59 now in this case nobody is approaching him but he is approaching somebody and he said unto another follow me but he said lord suffer me first to go and bury my father so jesus said unto him let the dead bury their dead but go thou and preach the kingdom of god now my dear friends in this case as i said this guy doesn't come to jesus and say i will follow you like the first guy jesus looks at somebody and says follow me hey this person is receiving an exclusive calling this person is receiving a special calling what a lovely thing for somebody to be called by jesus wow in 1979 when i became a christian immediately i received a calling to serve the lord and i was so happy that the lord called me to be a, a servant in his vineyard as i said i have been in many jobs in the past i have sung in the television been a musician i have been a manager in companies and 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 uh, i am a clinical psychologist and what not but i am so proud to be a servant of god in the ministry and this man is receiving an exclusive call from jesus himself 
Jesus didn't say to Peter or somebody, hey, go and call him to follow me. No. Jesus says directly, follow me. Wow. He should have left everything and gone behind Jesus. But he says, now listen to this. Listen to this very carefully. Listen to the subtlety of the word and the worldly fleshly desires in him. He doesn't say, no, I will not follow you. He says, yes, I will follow you, but suffer me first to go and bury my father. He was a Jew, apparently. And the Jews had responsibilities. Now, when you read this, don't think that there was a dead corpse. A, a, a father, his father was dead and he's wanting a few hours to go and bury the father. No. According to the Jewish tradition, if the father is old, then the, it's the son's responsibility to bury the father when the father dies. Thereby completing the responsibility. So here, this person was talking culturally nicely. It's a cultural perfection. Cultural nicety. He was being a very cultured person, respecting the culture. So, to the world, it would have been a very good thing. Wow, look at that son. Every father should have a son like that. He received a serious calling from Jesus. But he says, I will come behind you. But first, I need to bury my father. First, I need to be a good son to my father. First, I need to fulfill the cultural obligations that I, I have. <laughs> but Jesus knows this is just a tomfoolery. This is just a, an excuse, not the real story. That's why he says, let the dead bury their dead. The world is dead in their sin. And no, don't let the worldly responsible responsibilities come before you and God. Anything that comes between you and God is an idol. This man made his own father his idol. He made his own cultural values an idol. If you bring your culture... Between you and your God. Your culture is the idol that you need to destroy. I'm coming from a very strong cultural background. I'm a Tamil. Used to be a Hindu. And the Tamils have a very rich, strong culture. There are so many responsibilities that I have as a son, as a brother, as a citizen of Sri Lanka. I have a lot of cultural responsibilities but I cannot be what they expect me to be I cannot be culturally perfect culturally correct in terms of responsibility because I have a higher calling in my life I have a higher calling my priority should be Jesus my priority should be ministry my priority should be standing for and on the word of God. And nothing should remove the priority from my life. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and everything else shall be added unto thee. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. First is Jesus. First is my ministry. First is the word of God. And today, my dear friends, so many people are leaving Christianity, leaving the ministry because of the cultural expectations that they attempt to meet. And they are bringing culture into their lives. What is your priority? Is your priority your home? Is your priority your culture? Is your priority your life? Or is your priority Jesus? My dear friends, I am no longer a Sri Lankan by culture. And my friend David is no longer a Brit, a, a Brit by culture. 
I am a Christian by culture. I am a Tamil speaking culture, Christian who lives in Sri Lanka. And my priority is Jesus. My priority is the word. And today so many people cannot are unable to be used by God because they don't have their priorities correct. And if God is to use you, if you need to be in the other 70, then you need to put your priorities right. Priorities, God, His word, His kingdom, and then the other things. Anything which comes between you and your God is an idol. And God detests idols. He despises idols. Now when we say idols, we, we think about the images that those Israelites worshipped in, in, in those days. The huge images of heathen gods. Yes, that's true. But today, idolatry has crept into the church because so many things have come between the individual and his or her God. Let's go to the third point. Verse 61, and another also said, Lord, I will follow thee. In this third story, sto story also, like the first one, somebody comes and says, Lord, I want to follow you, but let me first go bid them farewell which are at home at my house. So he is saying, well, Lord, I, I want to follow you, but I want permission. Now here he doesn't just, if we don't know the Jewish culture, we will think that he's, he's going to just inform them. Because it sounds like that. But let me first go bid them farewell. So he's just wanting a few minutes to go home and say, Hi, bye mom, bye dad, bye brothers, bye sisters, I'm going okay. Bye. No, 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 no. Here I have investigated this to see what happened here. This guy wants permission from the house. He wanted them to release him to follow Jesus. Now Jesus says, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Wow, what a strong statement is that. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. He is saying, Look, no, you don't need the permission from anyone to follow me. My dear friends, this is very strong. Very strong. Because if somebody is to give you permission, that somebody is bigger than who is calling you to do that. If I ask permission from somebody to preach, then that somebody is bigger than whoever wants me to preach. And Jesus is saying, abstractly, you have made your family bigger than me. You want your family to release you to follow me. No. You have put your hand on the plow. And if you turn back, you don't need to take your hand off. But if you just turn back, then you are not fit, not to just serve me, but to be in the kingdom of God. I am running a Bible college, as you see, as you know. I am running a Bible college of young men and women. And sometimes some people come to the Bible college. And before they come to the Bible college, they say, well, we need to get permission from the family. What happens is, some families don't give the permission. Why? Because they are not still Christians. Even some Christian parents don't allow their sons to go to Bible college because they want their son to earn and provide for the family. And I tell them, if you want to serve the Lord, you come no matter what. Because the world is never going to allow you to serve the Lord. My dear friends, listen to this. The world and anything thereof will never ever allow you to serve the Lord. Because serving the Lord is detestable to the devil. And the world is controlled by the devil. And this guy wants release, permission 
from the home. And many students don't show up finally at the Bible college because they were disallowed. And today, unfortunately, in the many of the former so-called Christian countries, the church cannot do what the Lord wants the church to do without permission from the government, from that organization, from this, from that, and from the other. What has happened here in Great Britain? You cannot follow the Lord the way you followed the Lord in the 19th century. Why? Because you need permission from the government and the permission is not given. You are not permitted anymore to say Jesus is the way. You are not permitted to say Jesus is the only person through who you can get eternal life. You need permission. And the permission is not given. And therefore if you say certain things you are arrested. If you say what the Bible says, then you will be arrested. You don't have the permission to call certain sins, sins. You know, in June, I was in America. On the 26th of June, in America, they let uh, all 50 states, states accept homosexual marriages. And I was in America. And you know what? A long time ago, when I lived in England and when I, subsequent to living in England, I studied in America. And there were times when I really wanted, because of the persecutions that I had in Sri Lanka, to obtain citizenship in England and in America. I now thank the Lord that I don't have the citizenships. I'll tell you why. Last June, when I was in America, I was able to comment openly and publicly what the Bible talks about that, about homosexuality. If I was an American citizen. I would have been arrested. I just thanked the Lord. Thank you Lord. That at that time when I didn't realize. You did not let me have US citizenship. I can say what the Bible says. And I can get away with it. Whereas if I had an American citizenship. I would not have the permission to say because they'll arrest me. And that goes here too. I can speak the Bible because I'm not a British citizen. I'm a tourist. But the same thing that I say, if David says from here, he can be sued. He can be arrested. My dear friends, God's ways are mysterious. And I decided never to have UK citizenship or US citizenship because I want to come to this world, these, these parts of the world and to speak the word as it is because many of my dear friends like my brother Dave, is, they are unable to speak the word because they will be arrested. They will be sued. And today that's what has happened. People need permission to preach the gospel. But the world is not giving that permission so people cannot preach the gospel. And they need permission to do this and the other. And Jesus says, no, you don't need permission from anybody to follow me. Because if you seek permission to live your Christian life, if you seek permission from anybody to live your Christian life, then you are turning back. After putting your hand on the plow, you are turning back. And when you have a conviction, my dear friends, listen to this very carefully. If you follow the word as it is, if you follow Jesus the way he wants you to follow him, if you have that conviction, the devil will try to, to rip that conviction from you. The devil will try to threaten you. The devil will try to say that if you preach the gospel, if you preach what's in the Bible, the word will say that you are trying to control people. You are trying to manipulate people. You are trying to, to, uh, to, to, be, to make people believe something that is not right. I'll tell you, don't worry. Because Jesus says, if you don't do that, then you are like turning back after keeping your hand on the plow. If you Ah, have the conviction to follow the word as it is. Go ahead. 
boldly. Go ahead. The devil will bring storms in your life. The government will be bring pressure in your life. But go ahead. Don't turn back. Because you have put your hand on the plow. And if you turn back, you are no longer worthy to be in the kingdom. Let alone serve the Lord. My dear friends, the government disallowed me to start a Bible college. Do you know what I did? I started an underground Bible college. I started a Bible college, but to the world, it was nothing. But some young people coming and working in my garden. And today, those first graduates are running the Bible college. Pastor Danny, Pastor Charles, these are all first fruits of my ministry in Sri Lanka in the Bible college. They came and studied when the Bible college was not called a Bible college but an underground college. But I never gave up. And the government came after me. Police came after me. There were court cases against me. But there came a time when I came out victorious. And now our Bible college is a very famous Bible college. It's a very famous church. And now we are up in the, out in the open serving the Lord. Don't give up. The devil is powerless. The devil will scream. The devil will yell. The devil will try to show that he is huge. But he that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. And I don't want anybody's permission to do what my Lord wants me to do. That's what Jesus said here. And I believe I am fit to be in the kingdom of God. And I am fit to serve the Lord. Are you? If you are listening to this message, I'll tell you, you love the Lord. That's why you could be watching football. You could be watching a movie. You could be out and about doing whatever you want. But this, the simple fact that you are seated and you are listening to this message shows that you love the Lord. You love the Lord. But my dear friends, there may be issues that the devil is bringing into your lives to discourage you, to dishearten you, to shake you, to, to see, oh, how is this going to end? I'll tell you something. Jesus is always victorious. He was victorious. He is victorious. He will always be victorious. So go ahead. Cling to him. Cling to the word. And you will go through the battle. And you will come out victorious. Because at the end of the day, victory belongs to us. The battle belongs to the Lord. We don't need anybody's permission. I don't need anybody's permission to give my money to the kingdom. I don't need anybody's permission to give my, commit my daughter into full-time service. I don't need anybody's permission to preach the gospel as it is. I don't need anybody's permission to call sin, sin. I don't need anybody's permission. The Lord loves you. The Lord is in you. The Lord is with you. His power is in you. You are a powerhouse. You may not know it. You may not feel it. We don't need to know it because we are not called knowers. We don't need to feel it because we are not called feelers. We need to believe it because we are called believers. You have that great power in you. You have that great conviction in you. So, the three people, the three groups of people Jesus did not use. Number one, those who are after the worldly attractions. The worldly uh, attractive uh, goodies. Jesus said no. And number two, I have responsibilities. Let me first fulfill my responsibilities. No. Our prime responsibility is God and his word. And number three, I need permission from my superiors. My dear friends, our superior is Jesus. Our superior is the word. Are you glad about the other 70? I am really glad. And Jesus used the other 70. Wow. He appointed the other 70 also. 
and he sends them right and when they came back i want to just finish by by saying what happens uh, eventually verse 17 of chapter 10 and the 70 returned again with joy saying lord even the devils are subject to us through thy name wow but jesus said unto him, unto them i beheld satan as lightning fall from heaven behold i give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven my dear friends i'll i'll concise this i'll say it in simple words when the 70 people came they said oh jesus you know what we cast demons out they fled when we used your name things happened jesus says i saw greater things than you saw i saw satan himself falling from heaven so don't rejoice over what i'm doing through you rejoice over the fact that you will end up in heaven that you will spend your eternal life in heaven my dear friends the only hope that you and i have as christians is nothing to do with the world it's the eternal life i am willing to suffer till i die why because my life begins when i die my eternal life begins when i die and what i am doing here on earth is temporal i don't need to worry about comfort on this earth many people would want to settle first before doing things you can never settle because there comes a day when we need to leave the earth when we really commence our eternal life my dear friends work for that work for that hold on to the salvation that you have received praise god for the salvation we received through jesus and so many miracles are happening so many things signs and wonders are happening but don't be over excited by those be happy that your names are written in the lamb's book of life and that you are going to spend your eternal life with him in heaven i believe the lord has spoken to you much and that's revival having the faith of the eternal life envisaging the forthcoming glorious event of entering into the eternal life is what should give us joy we are happy people my dear friends christianity is the only faith that gives joy i say that all the time there is no joy in any other religion there is no joy in any other philosophy there is no joy in anything that the world gives there may be temporal pleasure but no joy but in christianity in jesus we have joy and the joy of the lord is our strength and to the poor church in philippi to the to the philippians paul through paul the holy spirit says rejoice in the lord always and again i say you say rejoice so let's be happy that we are part of the other group that the lord has sent and i'm so glad that i'm used by god in this 21st century to serve him the way he wants me to serve him and not the way the world or the world wants to serve him the world has changed the church the world has come into the church the church has sold its values and norms to the world and the world the church is serving the lord the way the world wants the church to serve but i am i'm so glad that the world has not come into my life and into the life and the ministry of my dear friend dave and his family and his folks we are in the minority but with jesus we are the majority all glory to god and may god bless you and uh, may the true revival of us giving our total self to god bring forth great joy dave on you know, to you my dear dear suresh 
as I'm going to bend down a little to be <laughs> your, your height. We have both been under criminal inquiry. Yeah. Yes. And us recently in UK and a few years ago now in Sri Lanka with Suresh. And when you get to the point where people complain, you know that you're really reaching it in God. Amen. Yes. Because that is when the conviction is at its height. Mm -hmm. And we get abusive phone calls here. We get people going absolutely crazy. And we get accused commonly of coercion, control, and the latest one is brainwashing. Okay. And I was with a policeman in St. Asaph, a very nice man, an understanding man. And he brought the issue up of control and manipulation. You know what I had to say? Mm -hmm. I have to admit, there is control and manipulation in this ministry. God. <laughs> I, I then said <laughs> that we become empty vessels, yes. that we're not our own. We're bought with a price. Mm -hmm. And that we are not to live our lives, but we are to be empty vessels mm -hmm. for him. And on the subject of brainwashing, I said, yes, there's that as well. That when we ask Jesus into our hearts, he washes our brains. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he renews our mind. Mm -hmm. He makes us as him. Amen. So what you said today is right in line with what we're teaching and preaching. And we're so glad that our Bible college here is connected, affiliated. Well, the word is covenant. Mm -hmm that we're covenanted together, we stand yes. together, we love each other, and we know that this has truly been of the Lord today, that you've come with your dear wife, Mercy, and daughter, Misha, that we're standing together in this call, and the world's going mad. Mm -hmm. The emerging church goes mad against us because we found it out mm -hmm. that Jesus is the Son of God, the mm -hmm. only way to the Father. Amen. That he has its, his standards. Yes. And there is only one type of marriage and only one type of lifestyle. Yes. I speak as Christ and the church. Mm -hmm. For a man leaves his parents mm -hmm. to be joined to one wife. wife. Yes. And from there comes the fruit from which the world can continue. Yes. There's only one way to the Father. And that is through the blood of Jesus, Jesus. Christ. Amen. And we stand together in victory today Amen. in the name of Jesus. Amen. Suresh, bless Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, Thank you Thank so you. much. And we're saying goodbye to you all. There's going to be more revival conference videos. And remember in 2013 being with my dear friend Wayne Weaver, who had a calling of God to have an annual World Revival Conference. And for whatever reason, that didn't occur last year. And the Lord spoke to me particularly to reinstate this World Revival Conference. My dear brother has a lovely heart. And obviously things could have happened that he didn't continue. But the Spirit is, said, is saying to continue this Revival Conference. For which we're bringing in speakers from around the world to speak the word of truth. In these days where the emerging church is taking over movement after movement after movement and nation after nation after nation, it takes the remnant to stand up fearlessly, not afraid of criminal prosecution, as Suresh has said, but a remnant which will move in power, not as itself, but as the manifestation of Jesus Christ himself on this earth. Lindsay, will you join me just a few moments? You know, Lindsay here loves Sri Lanka where Suresh, Mercy, and Misha come from. And the Spirit's moving us to build a building on the land of Suresh's college where people can come and be part of what is happening because if you look at our seven-year plan at ecctv.org, you will find that God is saying that from the south of areas or south of continents, and 
Lindsay, you'll remember God speaking to us that from Sri Lanka there'd be a move of God all the way going up to Tibet yes. via India, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, uh, and also uh, going up to Nepal, Pakistan, into Tibet. That that word is still there. And we know the Spirit of God is moving upon us to have a base with Suresh. So we can stand together, move together, see that northern area of Sri Lanka. As Suresh was saying, near Vavunya, where we've ministered already, that those dear people who have been through so much should receive the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is our passion. This is our heart. Isn't it, Lindsay? Yes, so, Lindsay, will you just share a little about that? And then we'll close this particular part of this conference for the time being, knowing the Spirit of the Lord is moving to worldwide revival. Revival of the old-fashioned type where we no longer live but Christ. Lindsay. Hallelujah. There is a, a, a wonderful move of God afoot this time for those who are open and willing, as dear Dr. Suresh Ramakandan has just been saying, who are willing to let the things of the world, the earth, grow strangely dim and to turn their eyes upon Jesus and fulfill his great commission, his personal calling on our lives. We should never be hindered by the devices of the devil. For he is a defeated foe. And our calling is very, very much to preach the gospel to every creature, especially from Sri Lanka to Tibet. And nothing, absolutely nothing, must stand in the way of that obedience to that call which is burning in my heart and in all our hearts in this ministry. There is no culture. There's no culture. We're citizens of the kingdom of heaven first and foremost. And that is what is number one. And we have this, we have this burning, burning, burning in our hearts for years, for years and years to fulfill this call, this mighty call. And we pray right now, we pray that into being, we know that God has called us and that he will do it through us, however the circumstances may look. Because as Pastor Suresh said earlier, we're not moved by what we feel or by what we see, but only by what we believe and is burning in our spirits. The word of Almighty God. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. He will have, he does have a word and a calling for each and every one of us. Dear viewers and listeners, and greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Thank you for listening to this wonderful, life-changing program of the Revival Conference. Amen. Thank you for joining us today on Every Creature Commission TV. You can find us at ecctv.org. The music you hear in the background is that of Reverend Dr. Suresh Ramakandran. Till Yen Nardel, Tumbatil Yen Ninbum, 
பற்றி அந்த கவலைகள் நை எல்லாம் தாங்குவார் பள்ளத்தாக்கிலி அது காலை விடி வெள்ளி பதினாயிரம் பேர்களில் சிறந்து And to quote Reverend Dr. Suresh Ramakandran, he said this, It's not the comfort we need, it's the commission. And he said unto them, Go ye into the whole world. Yes, preach the gospel to every creature. And you can contact us from the UK, 01492 54451. Or from overseas, 0044 1492. Five treble four five one. We thank you for joining us today. God bless you. சொர்க்கத்தை சேரையில் அவர் தீரு மோகன் தனை நான் காண்பேன் அவர் பள்ளத்தாக்கிலி அது காலை விடி வெள்ளி பதினாயிரம் பேர்களில் சிறந்தோர் இயேசு பள்ளத்தாக்கிலி அது காலை விடி வெள்ளி பதினாயிரம் பேர்களில் சிறந்தோர் பதினாயிரம் பேர்களில் சிறந்து பதினாயிரம் பேர்களில் சிறந்து பதினாயிரம் பேர்களில் சிற